Great. So I want to welcome everyone this evening uh, to this webinar titled Urine Drug Testing 101. Uh, this webinar is uh, being hosted by the Pennsylvania Pain Society, and it's being done in collaboration with the Pennsylvania Orthopedic Society, uh, the Rothman Opioid Foundation, and it's being supported uh, through an educational grant through the Appalachian Regional Commission. Um, I am Asif Ilyas. I'm president of the Rothman Opioid Foundation and a faculty member and surgeon at Jefferson and the Rothman Institute. And I'm happy to introduce uh, our speakers this evening. We have Dr. Michael Sprintz, who is founder of Solarian. Uh, Dr. Sprintz uh, is a national expert on addiction and chronic pain. He trained at the prestigious Johns Hopkins Hospital and MD Anderson Cancer Center and is triple board certified in addiction medicine, pain medicine, and anesthesiology. He is one of the pioneers in his field at the intersection of chronic pain and addiction. Additionally, Dr. Sprintz was part of the 2017 American Society of Addiction Medicine's Drug Testing Expert Panel that published the guidelines of appropriate clinical drug testing. And he's also the founder of Solarian, a software company that automates compliant medical necessity documentation for diagnostic testing to empower physicians and enable them to focus on patients, not just the paperwork. So we're lucky to have Dr. Sprintz. And in addition, we have Dr. Elliot Labovitz. Doc, Dr. Labovitz is, well, I should say, an attorney. So I don't know if, did I, did I, I hope I didn't offend you by saying that. I don't, I, That's I don't right, you gave me the wrong doctorate, to, Juris Doctor. Yes, I, <laughs> Juris Doctor. So I, I demoted you, so let me promote you again That's right. to Juris Doctor, Mr. Labovitz. It's a, it's a bad habit amongst doctors. We call everyone doctor. So Mr. Labovitz is a graduate of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill with a degree in economics and Georgetown University Law Center. Mr. Labovitz serves on a leadership team at Lighthouse Lab Services. So we're lucky to have Mr. Labovitz and Dr. Sprintz with us. I'm going to mute myself and hand it over to you two. And what I would say to the attendees uh, is uh, we have you all muted for now. Please put your questions in the chat. And as we approach the end of the talk, we'll tackle those questions among other questions. Uh, so uh, take it away, guys. Great. Thanks very much. I uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone. And I'm going to do a screen share here and we can get going. Um, here we are. And if everyone can, is that visible for everyone? Uh, I'll take that as a yes. Okay. Um, yeah, let's get over here, Dr. Sprintz. Uh, okay, great. So we'll get going. So the bottom line is the talk today is about drug testing. And, uh, you know, in the shadow of the opioid epidemic and the crisis, pain management has changed. Patient care has changed. All of this has changed. Uh, and we have to be aware of a lot more issues going on. And one of the great things that we've known about and have used for a long period of time is drug testing, but there's also a lot more to it than I think most physicians have originally um, had ideas about. So today we're going to talk about the basics of that. So why do we drug test? Well, the bottom line is clinical drug testing saves lives. So think about diabetes hypertension, right? So if you were prescribing insulin to a patient for their diabetes and you never check their hemoglobin A1C, you know, that's, it's malpractice You're, if you just keep on giving more and more. So here we are as pain physicians prescribing controlled medicines that one of the complications can be overdose, death, it can be addiction. Um, and so in, in that regard, it's one of those things that, um, it's important that we do the best that we can to keep our patients safe, especially in this era where the risks are high and, and the, the opportunity in order to, uh, to manage this is very reachable. So drug testing is one of those ways that enables us to find out what our patient's doing when, we're not, when they're not in the office. You know, what happens between 30 days between office visits? Drug testing helps. Um, so the importance, it's a valuable part of good patient care. At the end of the day, drug testing is one part of a larger comprehensive way that we care for our patients. Um, it improves diagnostic accuracy, it can improve treatment, and it can improve overall patient care. Well, why do you care? So what, right? Well, you know, the reality is, is that drug testing can drive clinical decision-making. 
It can help support patients that are that are appropriate and compliant with their medications. It can also help in early identification of patients who may have problems. So what this does for you is, well, it decreases the risk for you and your patients. It makes your work life easier. You're not trying to guess. And I know that most pain providers never got formal training in addiction medicine. And so you need a lot of tools around you that can help because, well, quite honestly, we've missed it for a long period of time. And there's a lot of patients that that are, it's not always the black and white, it's all of the gray. And so drug testing is one of the tools in our toolkit that helps us to identify someone who may have a problem. Um, it can help decrease overall healthcare costs, including drug diversion and improve overall public health because as I've mentioned already, it, it's a big problem. Um, so uh, Gourley and Haidt had posed something that really makes sense. Drug testing is done for the patient, not to the patient. And what that means, it's not about, oh, I'm going to catch that one. I'm going to catch that addict. It's about doing what's best for the patient. So whenever I think about my clinical decision making is what's best for the patient and what would I say on the stand? Because generally speaking, if I do what's best for the patient, then I can explain it and I can sit on the stand. I can sit with the patient. I can sit with anyone and explain why I'm doing it. Drug testing is about helping our patients, but we need guidance. Most don't understand the limits of drug testing. A lot of us, um, you know, the difference between presumptive and, and confirmatory testing. Not everyone understands the differences in cross-reactivity and false positives and false negatives. There's a lot of nuance to uh, drug testing that we have to, we have to look at. It's kind of like the old time when if for when everyone was in uh, residency and they're like, don't ever trust anyone who tells you that the that the radiology image was OK. Go down and check it yourself, because eventually someone's going to be like, oh, yeah, no, it's fine. Or they're going to look at it and they're going to miss it. Well, with drug testing, it's the, it's the same thing. Not every test is 100 percent sensitive and specific. It's not always accurate. There are other reasons why it, you know, you want to look at the whole picture and, and look at the tool with drug testing as a part of that. It's a powerful technology that helps support compliance in both recovery and in pain management. And what I mean by that is back in the day when everyone was prescribing opioids and we really weren't as concerned about overdose or addiction risk, and then the pendulum swung the whole other direction, right? And so suddenly there's a lot of fear about prescribing any controlled substance, not just opioids, right? Because other drugs can be abused. Benzos are abused. Um, there's gabapentin and Lyrica that are now being abused. There's, you know, Soma and muscle relax. There's all sorts of medications that can be abused. But it's also important that we care for our patients well, and there are appropriate patients for, uh, you know, when I prescribe, you know, and I, I prescribe opioids, I think opioids are great when used appropriately for appropriate patients. And when it's not appropriate, I don't prescribe them. And that's really the key. Drug testing helps us determine, well, who, who is appropriate? Do they have an appropriate pain condition that warrants the use of these? And if so, are they an appropriate patient for that? And we have to look at the whole patient and the drug testing is part of that. But it's important that we're able to support patients that are gaining benefit and function and that they're doing well with it and support those patients who are compliant, as well as identify patients who may have been doing well, but aren't any longer, or those who have a substance use problem or those who are diverting. Those are all important things for us. So it's this balance and drug testing is one of the tools to help us with that. Historically, drug testing was more used as a way for control and punishment and supporting compliance to treatment plans. And of course, that's, that's a generalization. So I want to be clear. I know there's a lot of great docs out there and have always used it in, in a way of supporting patients and helping them. But a lot of times it wasn't used in that way, unfortunately. Um, and patients were just discharged. The, immediately after a, a presumptive screen, I've heard stories about patients being discharged for a presumptive screen that was inconsistent. The funny part is I've been referred patients by that, and that didn't necessarily mean that the patient actually had a substance use problem or 
should have had the inconsistent test. There were flaws with that. So it's important that we actually look at the whole thing. There's also a tug of war, and this has been going on for a while, um, because between inappropriate testing practices as well as increasingly restrictive payer policies. So, uh, you know, about eight to 10 years ago, there was a lot of out of network billing that was done um, by providers with MSOs and out of network labs, and people were billing, you know, $10,000 a sample and getting five grand back. And, and it was this, it was a mess. And so a lot of all of that is has stopped. And so the pushback from that from the payer side was arbitrary restriction on the frequency of testing and extremely narrow definitions of medical necessity. And then uh, a refusal to reimburse for more accurate testing methods, as well as a decreased reimbursement and this egregious, um, overwhelming burden of administrative documentation requiring providers to justify medical necessity for each and every analyte. And those, those policies are still in effect today. Um, and, and so it's really important to see that although a lot of the inappropriate billing on the providers, all that's gone away, and there are appropriate safe harbor compliant ways for providers to bill for drug testing, there's still a lot of things that are going on in this in between the payers and the practitioners. But at the end of the day, this is about delivering good patient care, and that's really important. So what we're now facing is this problem of, of factors influencing drug testing. So you've got some, you know, sometimes people are over testing because they don't understand windows of detection. So uh, we see this uh, a lot of times in treatment centers where people may get tested multiple times every two days. Well, that, that doesn't make sense unless there's more clinical um, indications to test that patient. But we're also seeing, and what I'm seeing a lot more nowadays is under testing where a lot of providers are like, hey, look, I don't want to get nailed for, for fraud, waste, and abuse. And it's really more waste or abuse for over-testing without justification for it. And so everyone's under-testing. Here's the problem. They're missing patients that we could be helping. There are some of those patients, if you have a pain practice, you've had a patient who's overdosed at some point in time. Not necessarily on purpose or not necessarily because of anything that you did, but it happens. And it's important that when we're testing patients, again, think diabetes. If I'm not testing hemoglobin A1C and I'm prescribing insulin, that's a problem. If we're prescribing controlled substances that have a potential complication of an overdose, we need to be testing them. So it's important that we, that, that we learn how to do it appropriately. And there are appropriate ways to do it that, that make sense, that are reasonable, they deliver better patient care, and they're appropriate in terms of frequency and, and billing. Now, as everyone's realized, you know, when people talk about fentanyl overdoses in the medical community, we understand it's not actual fentanyl or fentanyl derivatives and their synthetic opioids. There's the bath salts and there's uh, the, the cathinones and the, a lot of the different derivatives that are coming down the market. There's more derivatives now on, on the um, amphetamine and methamphetamine-based drugs as well. And there will always be newer drugs that are coming out. Um, the way that people are using is changing. And the other thing is that the drug testing technology has also advanced. There's different types of biological matrices we can test. And we're talking about urine and we're talking about um, you know urine, blood, hair, saliva, sweat. There's a lot of things out there. And the reality is there are lots of ways to pass a drug test, okay? So it's not gonna be perfect, right? People like really good folks are going, there are going to be really smart, tricky, cunning patients who are going to pass your drug test, okay? The point is we wanna catch as, we wanna identify patients that are using inappropriately or that are trying to pass a drug test because at the end of the day it's our script it's our name and our license on that prescription and there's accountability that we have for that prescription once it leaves our office so it's important that we do everything that we can do in order to help our patients so smarter drug testing what does that mean it, it, there's a lot of common sense that goes along with it but 
really the basis of it is it's patient centered. It's cost effective. It's its goal is to help guide treatment over time. And that can mean confirming that the patient is appropriate with the medication treatment plan that we have. It's also good to help support um, patients that are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And for those who may have been doing well, but because of life circumstances or certain things that they you know, tilt over, not necessarily into full-blown addiction, but they start using their medications more to help cope with emotional psychological pain or because of acute stressors in their lives. And if we don't, if, or should I say, if we can identify them early, we can get them appropriate help and, and short circuit the behavior before it leads to a bad outcome. Um, it helps us advocate for our patients. It helps us, for myself, I am more comfortable prescribing for a patient when I have a means of holding them accountable as well, that I have documentation between that and the prescription drug monitoring database and the whole clinical picture, I'm much more comfortable prescribing for an appropriate patient for appropriate pain reasons. Um, additionally, it helps hold our patients accountable. Um, you know, I mean, if you got, if you got a detention because you were tardy in school, you know, or you were, you were held accountable for your work, that's important. Well, holding patients accountable is important in case they're having problems, but it's also great to support them. And, hey, look, you're doing great. I love it. You know, uh, your, your lab tests are normal. Your PDMP is, is normal. You seem to be doing better. Fantastic. It's another way that we can help support and encourage our patients in good behavioral change. And it's good for documentation for the clinical decisions we're making. Because if you end up on the stand someday and they go, well, doctor, why did you continue prescribing for this patient? Well, your honor, I prescribed for this patient because their confirmatory drug, their you know presumptive and confirmatory drug tests were all consistent and expected with the treatment regimen that we prescribed and other doctors prescribed. Their PDMP report was fine. They did not have any aberrant behaviors, yada, 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 boom, boom, boom. That helps support and protect us medical legally in case there's a bad outcome. And that has that may not have anything to do with us. Okay, so let's get to principles of drug testing. Um, so the drug test, it's important to understand the limits of drug testing. And that was always one of my favorite uh, cartoons there. So drug tests are designed to measure whether a particular substance has been used within a window of time. So hair tests are wonderful to detect use over the past 90 days. But if you just, you know, if you just took a pain pill, if you just took an opioid or a benzo or smoked a joint an hour and a half ago or three hours ago or yesterday, that's not going to show up in a hair test. Okay. But in a blood test or saliva or urine, you know, normally urine will, will help identify within about, within about 90 minutes to about three days, depending on the type of drug. So it's important that you know what you're testing and what are the limits of that detection? What am I actually going to detect as well as what substance? So what drug testing can do? It helps us in stratifying and managing risk in our patients, right? And it's one of the big things is how do I risk stratify my patients? They, they come in, they complain of pain. Well, are they low risk? Are they high risk? Oh, this is one of the tools to do that. It helps us deliver better patient care, as I've talked about already. And it helps support documentation of patient compliance with the treatment plan. And you'll notice I'm, I'm hitting topics more than once. And I'm doing that on purpose because it's important that you remember these key concepts. This is about helping us support our patients as well as helping us protect ourselves from, you know, when, when uh, if we need to justify why we are doing a certain, a certain treatment plan, this helps us justify that. So it helps us with initial assessment and treatment planning. So I have a new patient comes in complaining of pain. Uh, and actually, I had a patient come in when I first opened my practice in 2014. All right, the practice was in 2013. The uh, patient came in in 2014, well-dressed, suit and tie, professional gentleman with his wife there, telling me that he had this disorder, this immune disorder, and he needed opioids. And none of it made sense. 
So did a drug test and, and the drug test was negative. There's, there were no opioids in it, but he, then I checked a prescription drug database and he had had one of the largest um, PDMP reports I had seen in a long time. And this guy, he was a professional doctor shopper. Had I not done the other tools checking on this, with the, it's a new patient who came in. He didn't look like one, what one would expect. He, he was well put together. He had played this game. Um, so that's important. So, and then another patient who comes in, maybe a referral from a different doctor who's already on medication. Well, I want to make sure they're taking it. And if they're not, why not? Um, again, it's a great therapeutic tool. One of the great ways that I like to, um, especially with new patients is like, well, okay, we're going to, we're going to do a drug test today. If we're going to be prescribing pain medication, I'd like to do a drug test. And is there anything that I'm going to find in there that you may not want to talk about? And it's a really open-ended, non-judgmental way of saying, hey, look, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to scold you, but I need to know what's going on because if I don't know what's going on, I can't help you. And that's a really important thing when you're dealing with drug testing and how you talk with patients about it. It's important because everyone is afraid of being judged. And with pain patients, especially in these days, it can be a little, it can be scary for them because the power differential between us as the providers, especially if they're looking around um, and they've been to another pain doc already, there's already an assumption of like, well, are you doctor shopping? Do you got a problem? And so being open-ended about it is really a great way to keep the dialogue going with your patients. Um, another way is, and talking with them about it is, if they do have an inconsistent presumptive screen, you can always say, hey, look, this is a presumptive screen, you know, it was tested positive for blank, it tested positive for benzos, you're not prescribed benzos, what's going on? And even if they're like, well, I, I don't know, I didn't take it. Okay, well, we're going to send this for confirmation to make sure, and we can go from there. So it's really also about however we discuss our results with patients, being non-judgmental about it is really important. Because if you destroy that patient relationship, you may lose the opportunity to help them if they need help. And sometimes presumptive tests, actually, there are a number of times presumptive tests are not accurate. Um, combining it with other clinical tools, it helps us. Medication monitoring and identifying early deviation away from the patient's treatment plan. So again, patients' lives fluctuate, stressors fluctuate, and sometimes people can be doing really well for a while and then they lose a job or they get divorced or something happens and they lose a parent or a child and, and all of a sudden they start to use medication inappropriately. This is one of the ways that we can help identify that sooner than later. So here's what drug tests cannot do, all right? It can't tell you if a patient is taking their medication as prescribed, right? So normal, the usual urine drug tests that we do in, in clinical practice in most pain practices don't check steady state levels. Okay, so that's important to understand that just because they they had the drug present, that doesn't necessarily mean they were taking it as prescribed. It doesn't prove that the patient is diverting if it's not present. Okay, it doesn't prove that misuse has not occurred. Okay, so people can have a normal drug test and still um, and still have a they can have a normal drug test and still be misusing the drugs. And so um, there was a question, how does drug testing help stratify risk? Well, it helps stratify risk because if you have a patient who has an inconsistent urine drug test, that's an increased risk for a substance use disorder or something else that's going on. So by identifying an inconsistent confirmatory test can help you stratify your risk for that patient because they may not have a diagnosis of a substance use disorder. You may be the first person who's actually diagnosing this patient, okay? Um, so what drug tests cannot do is identify every possible substance that may have been used. There's lots of substances out there that people get on the street that may not show up in a drug test. That all depends on the drug testing panel that you have. And it cannot diagnose a substance use disorder in and of itself. So a drug test is not a substance use disorder diagnosis tool. It is a tool that helps lead us to the possibility that the patient may. And then you look at the bigger clinical picture. 
So remember, the drug testing is part of a toolkit that you use to clinically assess your patient. So this is really, really important. Uh, practitioner documentation. As we all know, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. We've been told that since medical school. Well, in terms of reimbursement, and, as well as justification for the delivery of healthcare services. So even if you're sending your, your labs out to somebody else to do it, and you don't have any financial you know, uh, dog in this, in this fight, the reality is, is that if you don't document the medical necessity for why you're doing that, that puts you at risk. So it needs to be patient specific. It must include, why am I testing this patient for presumptive? Why am I sending it for confirmatory? It needs to include the results in the treatment decisions, just like you do for a spinal cord stimulator or for any other thing that you, let's say you need prior authorization for, for, for a procedure for an RFA. Or for some, you have to document, hey, this is why I'm doing it in this patient, and here are the reasons why. And, uh, you know, just suspicion of substance use disorder or, you know, testing to see if they're taking the medication isn't good enough these days. Uh, the payers are requiring a lot more um, a lot more documentation, so much so that it's almost impossible to do. Uh, also, your practices, if you do testing, your practices need to have a written protocol. And the reason why you need a protocol and policy on drug testing is you want to, this is a risk management tool to avoid being accused of, of profiling patients or um, having a bias towards any patients. So when you have a written policy, this is how we test this is when we test, this is who we test, then it's clear for everyone. And so, well, no, you're just testing me more than other people. No, this is how we test our patients. And this is why you fall into this category. So again, it's another risk management tool that also helps you deliver good patient care. Um, when sharing results with uh, outside entity uh, entities, remember that the results should be confirmatory, not just a presumptive screen. And what I mean by that is, if you are making a clinical decision on a patient, if you're considering discharging a patient based off of inconsistent or unexpected drug test results, make sure, first of all, I don't recommend just discharging a patient because of that, I'd recommend referring them, but make sure that it's a confirmatory test, not just a screen, because there's two, you, the impact of that decision can impact a patient profoundly in a negative way if it's not accurate. So again, limitations of presumptive and definitive testing. So one of the limitations of presumptive screens are cross-reactivity. You have a lot, you can have false positives, and those are the little point of care cups that you do, little, or the dipsticks. Sometimes there are immunoanalyzers as well that people use that are desktop. The importance with that is that you can have false positives and you can have false negatives. The other issue is that with, with just screening tests, there's a lot of medications that we prescribe. Lyrica, you know, pregabalin is a great example of pregabalin and gabapentin are two drugs that are not available in a screen. So how do I know my patient's taking that? Well, I would need to do a confirmatory test on that. But it's, you have to understand that because if you get a presumptive screen back, and you accuse the patient of not taking their pregabalin based off of a screen, you're setting the patient up. So you want to make sure that your data is accurate, okay? And, and then, Dr. Sprintz, I'm going to jump in just for a moment and give you a second to have a sip of water. Um, thank you. Just to, to throw out some other words that people that are a little bit newer to the space uh, might hear when you're using the uh, the word presumptive. There's a lot of words that can get caught up and make you kind of confused about what's going on. Other words you might hear are, like you just heard Dr. Sprint say, a screen, whether that's, uh, he referred to a POC cup or a point of care uh, cup and the, the dipsticks that you've heard about. You'll also hear people refer to this as qualitative testing, aka a test that just gives you a simple yes or no answer. And um, those are kind of the big buzzwords that I think that that would catch about 95% of what you're going to hear out there in the presumptive world. For definitive testing, you'll hear the word definitive used probably as much as anything else. Confirmatory testing is another word. Quantitative, which gets to the underlying point of the biggest distinction between the two. That's going to give you the level set that uh, Dr. Sprintz mentioned earlier isn't always available with all tests of 
um, what you're looking at over time. And the last buzzword I wanted to kind of put on your radar is LCMS. That's the um, that's the instrument that's used to do definitive or confirmatory testing, which is distinguished from what Dr. Spence mentioned earlier was the um, immunoassay analyzer is what you're typically going to hear in the presumptive world. So I'll open it up more during the FAQ uh, or Q&A session at the end of the call. But I just want to take a moment there for people that might be a little newer to the space to know that's what those words mean. And we can we can dive in deeper if there's any questions about that at the end of the presentation. Now that you've had a chance to catch your breath for a second, Dr. Sprints, back to you. No, that was great. And I really appreciate you uh, expanding on that on that section, because sometimes I forget what everyone knows or doesn't know, and I make assumptions. So I appreciate that very much, Elliot. Um, again, there's, uh, there's tampering that can be done. Um, if you're not sure about a result and not sure about what it actually means from a clinical perspective, you can ask a medical review officer, is, and that's a physician who has become certified in interpreting drug tests. Uh, the lab toxicologist, you can always pick up and call the lab and say, hey, look, I've got this result, and I'm not really sure what to do about this. Um, and then also use non-stigmatizing language, okay? And that's really important, again, going back to your relationship with your patient. Dirty and clean are not appropriate terms to use for drug testing. Okay, there, the results are either consistent or inconsistent, and sometimes people use they're expected or unexpected, right? So an unexpected result is, oh, hey, there's cocaine here. Oh, okay, well, that is unexpected um, versus or inconsistent where, well, you should, be, you should be positive for oxycodone because I'm prescribing oxycodone and it's metabolite, but you're positive for morphine. That, well, that's not consistent. So it's important to use those words instead of clean or dirty. Um, shaming patients doesn't help solve the problem. So before before you go to the next slide, this is just a, a natural segue. The word tampering um, is plays a big reason into why uh, Dr. Sprints talked about the importance of uh, or the roles I should say that presumptive and definitive testing are both going to play. And um, I want to delve into just a couple of classic examples of people asking the question like, "Oh." Now I understand more why presumptive testing is not the gold standard that definitive is. One is if a um, an obvious one that a lot of people are going to do is, what if somebody comes in and has had a lot of water? You know, that's a urine-based drug test. Somebody has a lot of water. Well, one of the things that's going to happen um, in any test is there's going to be ways to try and identify th that exact version of, you know, tampering, which is, you know, um, you know, Gatorade, water, um, in excess amounts. And being able to get a creatinine-adjusted result, meaning the uh, the amount of creatinine that's found in the urine specimen to raise or lower the level of a certain drug that's in a system is only possible, honestly, with the combination of presumptive and definitive testing. It's probably the most common way that we're going to see, uh, although there were some more exotic ways that uh, Dr. Sprints put up on the slide a, a few slides ago of ways that people try and tamper with the test. It's the most common one that we're going to see. And it's a good example of the uh, the dance between presumptive and definitive testing where you need both. The presumptive test helps you get the creatinine adjusted level. And then definitive testing is going to give you the quantitative result that will be adjusted based on the amount of creatinine in the system. And there you go. The number one way of tampering has just been solved by a combination of the, of the two um, methodologies that we're talking about here today. Yeah, that was great, Elliot. Um, and I was thinking about that because as you were talking, you know, the reality is in the reality of clinical practice in the workflow, we don't do observed chain of custody screens. We don't. We do, it doesn't fit within the clinical workflow for for any of our busy practices. And so in that situation, Give the patient the cup, pee in the cup, they close the door. And what a lot of patients will do, and we've seen it um, in our in our own clinic as well, is they will either, sometimes they will take water, not only just drink Gatorade, but they'll dilute it with water in from the sink or water from the toilet. Um, you know, even sometimes you turn off the water, but you keep the water in the toilet there, they will use that. And, uh, and so that's the benefit of of definitive testing, which they do validity testing, which also tests for people who, who try to um, use other substances within it to break down the proteins, to tr all in an attempt to not have their drug detected. And so having definitive testing can actually identify 
the substances that are used to try to avoid detection. So it's all, um, it, it, it's really great. Yep. All right. Um, so the process of drug testing. Um, and again, there, there are benefit, there are pros and cons of both. So presumptive testing, which is, as Elliot said, qualitative testing or screening. So these are the, your immunoassay and your point of care cups um, or your dipsticks. Those should be routine. What's great about them is they give you an immediate response while the patient's there. So it's at the point of care. The problem is it's not as accurate. And so it gives you, I view presumptive testing as it gives me a way to start the conversation with my patients about what's going on if there's something inconsistent in the screen. And you don't always have to send it for confirmation. Um, if you say, look, it's positive for cocaine, the presumptive screen. And I look at my patient, I'm like, oh, hey, your, your, your screen came up positive for cocaine. What's going on? Well, you know, I was at this party and I met this person and well, I, you know, and, and yeah, I did, I did some cocaine last Saturday. Okay. Then I can uh, address it. Anything else I need to know about? No, no, no. Okay. Well, how often do you do cocaine? You can have that, those conversations. Um, or a lot of times what I'll get is, well, you know, Hey, look, cocaine showed up in your urine. Oh, no way, man. Wasn't mine. I have no idea how it got there. Or, well, your, your drug test was negative. Your screen was negative for oxycodone and I'm prescribing it. What's going on? I don't know, doc. I did just, I took one this morning, took one yesterday. Okay. Well then we'll send it for definitive testing and we'll go from there. So it's, um, more information can change management. So that's important. But at the end of the day, screening is great for an immediate result that so you can start the conversation with your patient, but I don't recommend making important big clinical decisions based off of a screen because and, of the high false positive and false negative risk. And I was going to throw out a couple of numbers for you. These are rounded. Uh, uh, there's a lot of clinical guidance. Obviously, the people who manufacture the POC cups will you'll get slightly higher numbers from them than you will the reference labs like Quest and LabCorp, who obviously want people to uh, send to them. So let's talk for a second about, um, you know, Dr. Prince talked about the, the timing aspect as well as the accuracy. So when we talk about a POC cup, the generally accepted number, and again, people are going to fight me on this both directions, is that a POC cup has by far the lowest accuracy rate somewhere in the 60 percentile when we talk about um, accuracy and specificity. That's obviously going to be a lot of false positives and false negatives. Um, but like Dr. Sprintz mentioned, those are ready Ooh, it's been a minute since I used a POC cup. I'll let you correct me if I'm wrong, but some are in as few as single digit number of minutes um, for the final result uh, from the POC cup. So certainly uh, while you're still seeing the patient, very doable. Yeah, uh, it's, it just has limits though, and you can't. Yep. That's right. So there's, you're in the 60s, but it gives you an idea of the direction that, you know, you can be pointing, you might have an idea um, of where things are headed. With the immunoassay analyzer, um, the results are actually uh, noticeably more accurate. You're going to find yourself uh, with specificity and accuracy in around 90%. So obviously a big step up from the instant uh, POC cup. There is a little bit of a trade-off there. If I could go back for just one moment, Dr. Smith, before we move on sure. um, to the last slide. Um, fast results. Those are theoretically available in real time on a screening mm. analyzer. But the practice of medicine, what's more realistic is you're going to have an answer within an hour or two or same day because so much of that testing is done in batches on an analyzer. That's one thing to, to be aware of is that you have to, um, it's going to be longer than the, the, the POC cup. So there's a little bit of trade-off, a lot more accuracy, but same day. And then the, the, on the high end, in the high 90s of uh, accuracy and specificity, you have quantitative testing, which... I would describe as best case scenario is available the following day. And in order for those results to be available the following day, you have to be doing, you know, basically in office testing, which we'll talk a little bit about at the end of the presentation, because realistically, if you 
collect a sample on a Monday and you're shipping it overnight to the to the lab and it's not processed till Tuesday, you're certainly not gonna have it same day. So we'll talk we'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation. But that gives you an idea of the accuracy levels that you should associate with each of the three types of testing. Somewhere in the 60s, around you know, for the POC cup, around 90 for the analyzer, and in the high 90s uh, for um, confirmation testing, which is you know certainly not perfect, but uh, definitely closing in on the standard deviations. Back to yeah, you. and 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 I apologize because I know that we're running fast um, on time, and I want to make sure that I leave more time uh, open for um, uh, for questions. So, definitive testing again, like uh, Elliot was talking about, is uh, liquid chromatography mass spec. Elliot, do you want to cover this one? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, sure, I'll, I'll jump in again, give you a chance to have a little bit of water. Um, like the slide says in front of you, you're going to be able to quantify the levels of each substance that's present. And it's mm -hmm. one thing to note is that uh, screens are basically good at identifying families of drugs. Individual metabolites are hard to distinguish um, or impossible, depending on exactly what they are, on the screen. So what it's going to do, a screening analyzer or a POC cup, is basically going to add up all the different compounds, whether that's the metabolite uh, or the drug analyte itself, meaning the you know unabsorbed, unmetabolized version of the um, of the pill, and it's going to group it all together and say if it get above it gets above a certain number. When you add up all those numbers together, it's going to say yes for this family of drugs is positive, whereas each individual analyte is tested on the LCMS, and so you are no longer looking at families overall. It's going to be specific to a given analyte or metabolite, which is nice because if somebody comes and takes a pill immediately before um, taking a screening analyzer, presumptive drug test, it'll show up as positive. It's going to say, hey, we, you know, it's in the system, whereas it hasn't been metabolized the way it would have if they would have been um, taking their pill consistently. And so those are some of the um, things you're going to see very different in the results from a confirmatory test or a definitive test. Um, also, the you know I can't I can't begin to explain to somebody uh, in your shoes. It sounds silly to talk about the importance of not getting things wrong and trying to limit the false negatives and false positives. And so um, the accuracy numbers that I talked about on the last slide, uh, the importance of that can't be overstated. Obviously, the last thing you ever want to do is have the really hard conversation about inconsistent results only to find out that you fell into the 30-ish percent of POC cup results that are wrong or the 10 percent of screening analyzer results that are wrong. So obviously getting up into the 99, um, which depend on your exact test, you, you can, um, is a, um, you know, is an important role for definitive testing. Yes, absolutely. You do not want to make big clinical decisions on a presumptive screen. So why may a drug not be detected? Well, sometimes the patient didn't take the drug recently. So overuse, meaning they could have had increased pain or they were using too much, or they could be diverting it. Sometimes you've got patients who have abnormal drug metabolism and someone had asked a question about uh, pharmacogenomic testing, which is beyond the scope of, of this presentation, but there can be abnormal metabolism. Um, lack of test sensitivity, right? A presumptive screen doesn't have certain, uh, doesn't test for certain uh, drugs or medications, and false positives and false negatives. Um, frequency of tested should be dictated by patient acuity and risk factors. Um, generally speaking, baseline testing and before you start a, uh, um, a controlled substance, uh, new patients, chronic opioid therapy about once a month with consideration for less frequent testing if the patient's compliant with things. Ideally, you want to test patients randomly. It can be very challenging. Uh, and in testing them uh, randomly based off of our clinical workflow, but it can be done. So generally, uh, who, do, who do I test and when? I test new patients because I wanna know what's going on with my patient before we even get started. Um, patients that I'm considering prescribing a controlled substance for. So even if I'm not considering a controlled substance for a patient, if they're a new patient, I wanna know because I could have a patient with an alcohol use disorder they may not be doing any other drugs, but with an alcohol use disorder and um, who could have potential liver failure. And if you have liver failure, then you have coagulopathies. And if I'm sticking a needle in their back and I don't know that they may have liver failure because of alcohol, because I never asked and never tested, 
all of a sudden I could be in a whole heap of trouble and so could our patient. So I like to test all my new patients to get a baseline on where we're at. Established patients, if I'm going to begin therapy or if I'm changing therapy, um, that's a good time to do it. Randomness at, at an appointment, but again, have a testing policy and clinical indications of concern, aberrant behavior, family members concerned they're selling their drugs or using drugs inappropriately or some other issues. Patients that are resistant to a full evaluation, you know, the patient who, who doesn't agree to it. Um, and if someone, if a patient refuses a drug test, they have a legal right to do that. I also have a right to not prescribe for a patient if they refuse a drug test. Um, an inconsistent prescription drug report. Um, patients with a known substance use disorder or who are at high risk. But also remember that there's also patients who are at high risk and those are those patients with cognitive dysfunctions. The little, you know, an 80 year old lady with, with, early, you know, with um, senile dementia who happens to also be on a benzodiazepine because her primary care doctor wants to help her sleep at night. I mean, that's a huge risk if I'm going to consider prescribing an opioid for her arthritis pain. Um, and to help support decisions to refer. If you're going to refer someone, you better have the documentation for why you're doing it. So again, understand the results. Again, like we're talking about, understand the limitations of definitive and presumptive testing. Um, attach a meaningful therapeutic response, meaning it's avoid, I got you, I knew it, uh, you know, get out of here. Uh, be non-confrontational, but also non-judgmental and have a conversation with it. Look at the bigger picture with the patient if the results are inconsistent to make sure that it's an accurate, true positive, not a false. Um, and if you're not sure about the presumptive, send it for a definitive. Again, presumptive is just that. It's presumptive. It's right. not positive. Um, Again, if uh, urine drug test is a presumptive positive, discuss it with the patient like we talked about, review the meds, send for definitive testing. There's a lot of over-the-counter stuff that can cause false positives. Um, and then again, discuss, if you're not sure, discuss it with the lab about inconsistent test results or what could cause that. Ask for help. You don't have to do this all on your own. Um, and again, if you decide that you are gonna discharge a patient based off of uh, inconsistent confirmatory quantitative results, refer them, refer them to a specialist if it's an addiction specialist or someone else, instead of just discharging them. You want to get the patient to the help that they need. Um, and again, look at the whole patient. So some clinical questions. Elliot, do you want to jump in from here? Um, sure. And in, in the interest of time, I'm gonna, um, yeah, jump. yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> Try and leave five minutes at the end to ask questions. I'm not sure the rules on going over, but certainly I'm willing to stay for a few minutes and answer additional questions. But... Elliot, this is Robin. You hey, are Robin. certainly welcome to go over. This has been excellent. So if we go over a little bit, it's okay. Understood. Well, I will make sure that only the FAQ part runs over just in case people need to jump. Um, but the scope of the problem, which is on the screen in front of you, gives you some idea of the <laughs> the mountain um, of prescriptions that are not only be written with a tiny compliance rate. And again, some of that lack of compliance is more benign than others. So, uh, but, but suffice to say, 50% of all the prescriptions that are being written by people on this call, and probably a higher percentage, honestly, of people on this call, um, just by the nature of uh, the care that you're giving, are being taken incorrectly. And you can look at the annual cost, which is, of course, secondary to patient care, but we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of expenses um, in dealing with this problem that's created. In the interest of time, let's jump two slides uh, to 38, if you would. I believe it's 38, mm, 37, pardon me, right there. That's perfect. So I wanted to spend just a moment talking about the financial side of the equation. Um, <clears throat> the first four codes you see listed here, G0480, through G0483 are the four different tiers of drug uh, classes. Uh, you'll hear them, you'll see them, they're listed as uh, confirmatory tier one through tier four. Those are the four different classes that CMS and 99% of payers are currently using in order to reimburse for uh, confirmatory testing. The reason there's four tiers, it's basically more or less lines up with how many analytes you're looking for in a given specimen. They wanted to reimburse uh, labs and providers that were testing 
for more items, uh, a higher number than people that might be doing a more limited test. So you see the reimbursement, these are CMS numbers uh, from 2023, range from $114 all the way up to 246. I just wanna compare that to 80307, which is the fifth code listed here. That's the analyzer test um, that uh, pays $62.14 um, under this year's uh, reimbursement schedule. That does not matter how many different analytes you're looking for or drug classes, you're gonna get paid whether you look for one or 10 different families of drugs on that analyzer test for 80307. And then the last code, 80305, that's going to be the POC cups that Dr. Sprints uh, actually talked about first uh, during this presentation. The instant result, uh, you get paid $12.60, whereas the cost for that test um, from most providers is just going to run you a few dollars. Uh, so um, only two of these codes maximum will ever be billed for a given patient on a given day for a collected sample. You are only going to have either an 80305 or an 80307. Those are the two screening options, presumptive options. One of those two can be billed. And then as needed, you're going to see a confirmatory test, one of the first four codes listed in a company. So you might have 80307 and GEO481, but you will never have 80305 and 80307. With my last couple of minutes here, I also want to talk about um, a slide that we skipped over which was the possibility that some people on this call um, now or some that are watching this later will be interested in bringing your laboratory in-house. And one of the things that, uh, what some of the advantages that might one might consider in, in doing so are some of the things listed on this, on this page. With the number one thing I wanna highlight being the improved uh, control, which is the, the last thing listed here. When you send your sample out to LabCorp and Quest, uh, who are you know the two more popular labs in America today, uh, plenty of other options, but uh, those reference labs, obviously, they're being collected, they're being uh, put onto a truck uh, or an airplane or both, shipped out overnight, sent into a large lab. Uh, you get your result back um, on the timeline that, that works for them. Sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's less quick than you need. Bringing your labs in-house has a couple of big patient care advantages, which is a lot fewer hands are touching your sample. There's no need to ship. You can get quicker results because a sample that's collected on a Monday can theoretically even be resulted on a Monday, but more realistically, a sample collected on a Monday can be run overnight um, for confirmatory tests and still reported out on a Tuesday in the example that I'm giving here. And um, <laughs> obviously it's, Funny that at this top of this call, I was called doctor, whereas actually I, uh, I'm a lawyer. One thing that uh, goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, is that there is um, there is the Stark Law, which generally prevents self-referral. But there is also an exception called the in-office ancillary services exception that allows providers to self-refer um, for this exact purpose, which is CMS uh, realizes that uh, what is often in the best, the best, leads to the best patient outcomes are providers running samples in-house, keeping control of the sample, getting quicker results back. And there are a large number of companies, including the one that I happen to work for, uh, that are set up to help you do just that. So in you know some of the other things you see listed here, personalizing lab reports, making sure you get timelier results, having on-demand access to toxicology and technical support experts uh, to make sure you're getting the best results uh, and the most accurate results that you can, all of those things. Uh, are available as you bring consider bringing testing in house. Um, and just in the interest of time, I'm going to pause here so that we can spend a few minutes. And like Robin gave us uh, the green light to run over and just see if there are any questions uh, that anybody wanted to throw into the chat. I don't think the chat is locked. I'm going to test. Yeah, it. I've been trying. I've actually been trying to answer some of them. Okay, the, perfect. The you're you're one one step ahead, uh, Dr. Sprints. Anything particularly interesting that we should? Uh, respond to in the Q&A uh, out Actually, loud for those that haven't had a chance to read? Yeah, someone asked, uh, I was just typing a response to it, a great question about how do you clinically handle an inconsistent non-office-based confirmatory drug test in a patient who signed a drug contract? Fire the patient, refer, second chance. Um, That's a great question. It's, it's excellent. You know, the first thing you need to do, though, is get more information. You want to make sure that the confirmatory, it, that it is accurate. You want to, the first thing you do, you talk with the patient. 
talk about the results. Hey, look, your confirmatory test came back inconsistent. What's going on? And they may tell you what's going on. They may deny it. You know, it, I've seen both. Um, you know, the next step is look at the bigger picture. Does it make sense? I've had a couple of patients who had an inconsistent confirmatory test, but it made no sense with every aspect, everything else going on with the patient that had been consistent, their behavior was appropriate, long-term patient never had an issue. Um, and so it, it didn't fit the clinical picture. So remember, drug testing is a data point. So an inconsistent drug test is a data point. It's an important one, but make sure that you're looking at it in the context of the whole clinical picture. Um, in some patients, uh, an inconsistent confirmatory test is just, oh yeah, okay, that confirms what I already was thinking was going on with this patient. So then the decision of, well, do I fire them? Do I refer them? Do I give them a second chance? That's an individual provider decision in, it, that's a case by case basis. It really is. You have, you know, part of it depends on your comfort level and addressing, assuming that that it's accurate and assuming the whole picture is the person has a substance use problem. Well, then it comes down to your comfort level of managing that. I never recommend firing a patient. Um, I rarely fire a patient. Most of the time they will fire themselves. But by drawing my own boundaries, hey, look, because you know, if, if they have a substance use problem and they're not appropriate, that means, you know, an active substance use problem means you are not appropriate for me to be prescribing these certain medications for. And there are exceptions to that, but that's a whole different conversation. But at that point, it's one of those things where having that, I may not, the patient may not be appropriate for those medications, but I can still offer other therapies, but just opioids are not one of them. And then the patient will make a decision. Sometimes the patients will stay. Look, doc, you were honest with me. I appreciate it. I'm going to try and do this without pain pills. Fabulous. You know, therapy, interventions. There's a lot of other tools that we can use. And sometimes they'll be like, screw you. I know what my body needs, and I'm going to go find a doc who's going to do it. Okay, that's their, that's their prerogative. Um, I always recommend referring, not just firing. Because if you just fire a patient, they're going to end up at a, one of your colleagues' offices or the ER. It's not good for the patient. It's not good for the healthcare system. It's not good for anyone else. So try and refer to, um, if you're concerned about a substance use disorder, refer them to an addiction treatment facility for an evaluation or an addictionologist, someone who's trained and boarded in addiction medicine who can evaluate the patient. And then talk with them. Because you can still manage these patients. Patients in recovery are great. Patients in good recovery who have chronic pain are actually great patients. They're accountable. They're responsible. Um, so, in, and you can coordinate with an addiction doctor, and that actually is the best case scenario. So, at the end, it's an awesome question, and it, it requires a detailed answer, and it really depends. So, I hope that helped at least give some guidance on what to do next in those situations. Yes, and just make everybody make sure you can see some of these questions are listed as open versus answered for those of you following along. Um, I'm going to quickly add a couple of two cents. Thanks to Dr. Sprintz for answering a bunch of these questions um, at the end of the presentation, pulling double duty there. Um, but I'm going to give a quick answer to some of uh, some of the ones that I see here that are, I think are worth noting. One is uh, somebody asked Dr. Sprintz, uh, what do you think about pharmacogenomic, aka PGX testing in the pain arena? And one thing that I would tell, what I, what I would mention briefly is that, you know, Dr. Sprint says, just reach out to me and it's a, it's a longer answer. I'm going to try and give a quick one, which is it plays a role, but my experience would tell, would be to advise you that it, um, it's relatively limited. There, most people are going to be a normal metabolizer, but there are exceptions. So it is a great tool to use to find those people that are not normal metabolizer, but it's not absolutely necessary most of the time to get most of the accurate results that you need. It plays a role. Um, it does play a role, though. The other question just below it um, was about sputum, which uh, Dr. Sprintz correctly points out. Like, I think you're talking about oral fluid is probably what you've heard of happening in this space. Oral fluid testing is a lot less common for a couple of reasons. One, the technical issues with testing oral fluid are much higher than with urine. Um, there are all sorts of uh, you know issues associated with that matrix is the number one reason why it's uh, less common. Um, but 
in short, you're going to have, as a general rule, the best accuracy with uh, with urine testing, but reimbursement doesn't change. Neither does the instrumentation that's used uh, to do uh, screening or confirmatory testing. That's all the same. Now the workflows are a little bit different, but uh, they do they are the same. Let me keep trying to fly through these. The cost of testing difference between presumptive and confirmatory testing. I I interpret that differently. You, Dr. Sprint said, "Hey, you you can see the reimbursements thrown up on the screen now." <laughs> if you're talking about the cost of doing the test, um, what you're going to see is that doing confirmatory testing in-house is two, three, maybe even four times more expensive than running a screening analyzer, um, which you might be able to do you know, for an all-in cost of 10-ish dollars per sample. Um, the oh. analyzer cup 80305, which is on the screen in front of us right now, again, will be a few dollars. And if you made me say, hey, what does it cost to um, you know, all in to run a confirmatory test, 20, 30, 40 dollars, depending on your sample volume, is a good guesstimate at where you'll be, uh, depending on what your volumes are, because it is a volume based game where the cost to run the first sample every day is a lot more expensive than to run each additional sample after that. What I found in our own clinical practice was that what I one of the things that I loved about doing, and we've done in-house testing in our clinical practice for a little over a year once we got a, a high a volume. But the the reality is is that it's one of the best ancillary service lines that we have from a revenue perspective, but it's the result of delivering good patient care. And for me, that's always important. I I have got no problem making a good living. We work hard. We for all this, and as long as you're doing it appropriately. And it's a great ancillary revenue source that's the result of delivering good patient care. So the ROI, the return on the investment for an in-house lab in our clinical lab was something that we found um, to be uh, pretty significant, um, you know, probably about 250%. So it was uh, definitely was worth it if you have a high enough volume. Elliot's correct, it is a volume game. But if you're a busy pain practice, um, generally speaking, your patient basis are, are, is enough. And if you're able to document well and um, minimize your denial rates, that, that will actually increase it as well and improve your compliance. There were two other questions that I wanted to answer before Dr. Sprints. I'll let you uh, jump in. And I apologize. I don't know how long we're going to go, so I'm going to go quickly. Uh, yeah. We have a, a question about using a, a TOF, time of flight instrument, to be able to use for conformatory drug testing, unfortunately, no, uh, you're going to need to use an LCMS in, in order to be able to do that um, effectively. Uh, so that is a, a little bit of bad news there. Um, I wanted to really quickly, there were two more. Um, we have a question about, uh, does CMS ex expect to have a lot of POC, a little bit less presumptive and a little bit less confirmation? And I would like to say that, um, that generally POC, and analyzer testing are treated as one and the same. That is the general rule. So no, I wouldn't say you would expect to have, you know, to do a POC and then a little bit less from the 80307, which I think when you say presumptive, you're probably referencing that analyzer code and then go down from there um, from a confirmatory testing standpoint um, to have less. But I would say it is the norm to, to generally have more screens than confirmation for the exact reason that Dr. Sprint said, which is, if you get an absolutely consistent result with a patient that has few factors that would indicate a problem, well, hopefully you're not needing to do a definitive test every single time on every single patient you're screening. Hopefully, um, and this gets to one of the other questions, you're able to internally stratify some risk before ordering the test because one of the other questions that was up there is how does drug, drug testing help stratify risk? And I think that Dr. Sprint, I'll let him speak to it. I would say it almost certainly does but also it's important to be doing it on the front end and say, not every patient can be the same. We're not going to test everybody the same. Not everybody has the same uh, risk factors. Um, Absolutely. And then the last question I'm going to answer, and then I'm going to kick it over to um, Dr. Sprints to bring us home, is uh, Megan asked a question about not getting paid for a, a given code. So what I would say is different payers have different rules. You're going to see some people that require all sorts of documentation, which Dr. Sprints talked about for just a second earlier. It's one of the um, the big problems that Solarian has been created to help providers solve is why am I not getting paid for a medically necessary test? Help me prove the medical necessary 
uh, the medical necessity because I know it in my heart and I know it for my clinical skills that I need this test. What's going on here? So Megan, one of the things that I would say is that there are um, RCM um, and billing advisors to help you figure out why that's going on. It could be as simple as the wrong ICD code being attached to it, or it might be a payer policy um, that is especially strict on one of the higher tiers of testing with the higher reimbursement rate. But definitely reach out to um, Dr. Sprintz and I afterwards um, via email, and we will be happy to help see if we can get you some questions, uh, I mean, some answers there. Um, I'm going to pause there. Dr. Sprintz, any other questions that you wanted to try and wrap up? I know we're 10 minutes over at this point. Yeah, no, the last thing was really the, the question about what CMS is expecting. Um, I want to clarify that whatever CMS expects, that's great for CMS. At the end of the day, as a clinician, it's a patient-by-patient -patient decision, okay? And CMS may expect that we do more screens than confirms, and that's fine. Um, but at the end of the day, the whole reason why we're documenting medical necessity and why we're documenting what we're doing is because I'm taking care of my patient. And if this patient needs it, if 50% if of my patients or 80% of my patients need a, a presumptive and a confirmatory, as long as I am documenting why I'm doing it, I, it doesn't matter what CMS expects or doesn't expect, I can defend that. Because at the end of the day, I am responsible for my patient care, not CMS. And so that's a real key thing to remember of how your testing is, like they say, they want us to test each patient specifically and understand why we're testing each patient specifically. But for us as clinicians, we have to, as long as we have, we've documented why we're doing what we're doing, then it, it that's fine. Then it's, it's defendable here. Look, this is what I did. This is why I did it. And you're good to go. So it's let's uh, let, let, let's let's pause there. Uh, I want to thank uh, um, Dr. Sprintz and Dr. Leibovitz, Mr. Leibovitz. Sorry, I keep demoting you. I'm so I'll, sorry for that. I'll, such I'll a bad ha it. such a bad habit of mine. Um, for really an uh, excellent uh, webinar, uh, both great topics and great questions and engagement from from the audience as well. Now, what I want to say is just two things. One is uh, besides thank you. One is. Do you want to share any contact info either now or later? You're welcome to if you want to put it in the chat or or if you want uh, Robin to share it. Again, you don't need to if you don't want to, because but I'm sure you'll have some engagement both for questions as well as engagement with your company. Um, so if you want to say anything to that or anything, just let me know. Or, or you have the floor right now if you like, but no pressure. I'm actually just trying to put the screen. Yeah, go ahead while while he does that. I'll, uh, I'll also add it to the chat. Oh, go ahead, Robin. And I'll also email it out to everybody as a thank you for attending, and they have all of your information for questions and everything. If you, if that, this okay, it, it yeah, was up I on the just, last slide. Yeah, yeah I just um, uh, here we go. Um, is that it? That's there it. There we go. I changed my email. It, it's M Sprints, not um, uh, not Michael. I'll be right back. Yeah. So yeah, if anyone wants to take a shot at that, but that will be in our in our slides. So I just want to thank you both for your time and expertise today and thank the Pennsylvania Pain Society for hosting. Robin, do you want to wrap it up out here? I just would like to say I was very pleased to see our excellent audience this evening. The questions were engaging. Everybody's still on the line. Please, please watch for um, announcements for the next one. We have a couple of great talks coming up, so we'll look forward to seeing you in the next few weeks. And we actually have two um, webinar series that are simultaneous, one with the Rothman Opioid Foundation, which uh, Dr. Elias is the president of, and we're thankful for your support. We also wanted to thank Dr. Sprintz, and I will say Dr. Leibovitz, because as attorneys, we have a doctorate of jurisprudence. Oh my so God. we are doctors too. <laughs> I'm getting off the line. No. But I, I wanted to say thank you very much. And thank you to Light, Lighthouse Lab Services for helping us get this put together. And this is a free service because of the grants that we received that these CMEs can be offered. So thank you all. And the next time we talk will be the beginning of the month. We'll look forward to seeing everybody. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks you. for having me. I appreciate you, it. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Good night, everybody.